The first concentration camps were erected in Germany in February 1933. Primarily these camps were used to house and torture political opponents. The camps held some 45,000 prisoners and during the mid to late 1930s these camps were greatly expanded. When SS Heinrich Himmler took control of the concentration camp system throughout Germany he started using the camp's facilities and personnel to purge German society of so-called racially undesirable elements such as Jews, criminals, homosexuals, Jehovah's Witnesses, gypsies, and any other elements deemed a threat to Nazi rule. As early as 1940, the situation in the concentration camps had become untenable due to the new policies of arresting and detaining enemies of the state. News had already circulated through SS channels that government officials were now demanding immediate action in the expansion of the concentration camp system throughout Germany and its new conquered territory, Poland. The German authorities quickly pressed forward to establish various camps where the arrested could be incarcerated and set to work as stonebreakers and construction workers for buildings and streets. It was envisaged that these people would remain as a slave labor force, and it was therefore deemed necessary to erect these so-called quarantine camps in order to subdue the local population. Initially. It had been proposed that the quarantine camps were to hold the prisoners until they were sent to the various other concentration camps in the Reich. However, it soon became apparent that this purpose was totally impracticable. So, it was approved that these camps were to function as a permanent prison for all those who were unfortunate enough to have been sent there. The thousands of concentration camps that were built across Europe functioned as a whole very well albeit run barbarically by the individual camp commandants. Under their strict command a number of the camps were constructed by the inmates themselves. Every day the prisoners were forced to work in all weather conditions often without a break and continuously being subjected to appalling brutality. Despite the conditions the commandants were determined to get the prisoners to complete the buildings no matter how it was done. Most of the buildings that were built served merely to house and provide the basic needs of the prisoners, guards, and SS staff that ran the camp. Once the camps were built some of them were used not just to incarcerate the prisoners, but to force them to work as slave labor. This consisted of making them work either inside the camp itself, or in moving them to various sub-camps where the prisoners would work in factories, often for large German-owned companies. This was very lucrative for the SS and the companies that became involved. As the concentration camp system grew and new polices evolved some of the camps became dual purpose, labor and death camps. Other camps too were constructed as death camps, their only function was to murder. In direct response to the growing demand in concentration camps the SS needed civilian expertise to help install heating systems, electrical gear, and sewage systems, and also to build chimneys, and other buildings such as crematoria. Many civilian companies were involved, in their professional capacity, with genocide, with lots of them eager to produce the goods for the SS for financial reward. Many SS men who entered the realms of the concentration camp system welcomed the chance of joining this elite organization because of its strict system of beliefs and values based on the military virtues of obedience and self-discipline. They sought the idea of becoming part of the SS not purely because it was the racial ideological elite, but for status reasons and the chance to become part of an organization that could possibly control the course of Germany's path to recovery. Joining the SS also meant camaraderie and career prospects. Heinrich Himmler, commander of the SS, had made considerable efforts to recruit members of the old German elite and, through a tactful combination of pressure and adulation, to invite many fighters of the old German guard to give up their daily jobs and become full-time members of what became known as the Black Order of the new SS Staat. Within months many of these new recruits had formally joined the SS, and were soon assigned to run the various new concentration camps that had sprung up across Germany. One of the earliest camps, called Dachau, 
would be regarded as the foundation of all other camps. SS Theodore Ike had been made commander of Dachau concentration camp in June 1933, and became a major figure in the SS. He was regarded as the architect, builder, and director of the concentration camp system and ruled it with an iron fist. As a man he was stocky in appearance, blatantly brutal and ruthless, and gave off an aura of raw energy. Dachau was located on the grounds of an abandoned munitions factory near the medieval town of Dachau, 10 miles northwest of Munich. It was the first regular concentration camp established by the National Socialist government and was regarded by Himmler as the first camp for political opponents who were seen as an imminent threat to the new German government. Dachau was established on March 20, 1933, and it served as a prototype and model for the other concentration camps that followed. Its basic organization, camp layout, and construction of buildings were developed and ordered by Theodore Ike. Dachau was not like a normal prison. Here, the inmates did not know how long their sentences would run. They led an existence of uncertainty when they would see freedom again. Life for the prisoners inside Dachau was brutal. The SS guards were all ordered to follow Ike's demand for blind and absolute obedience and to treat each prisoner with fanatical hatred. By perpetually drilling his SS guards to hate the prisoners, they were able to infuse themselves with anger and mete out severe punishments. The training which the SS guards were given at the camp was relentless. They learned about enemies of the state, and were given an in-depth indoctrination into SS philosophy and racial superiority. These ideological teachings were aimed at producing men who ardently believed in the new Aryan order. Regularly the SS staff had to listen to the commandant lecturing them about anti-Semitism. On the notice boards inside the SS barracks and canteen there were copies of the racist newspaper. Propaganda newspapers were deliberately pinned up in order to foment hatred and violence against the prisoners, and to encourage anti-Semitic behavior among the staff, especially the younger men. In Ike's view, once his staff had learned their trade of brutality without the slightest compunction, the commandant had absolute power over them. All of the staff at Dachau were indoctrinated into a fanatical determination to serve the SS with blind allegiance. Ike invested each SS man with life and death power over all the inmates of the camp. Rule breaking among the prisoners was classified as a crime. It was looked upon as an incitement to disobedience and each guard was given power to hand out stringent punishments. The Dachau formula for mistreating the inmates sometimes affected the guards, but as members of the SS they were compelled to implement orders to be cruel to the prisoners with horrific efficiency. All SS were given extensive freedom to deal very harshly with any inmates they deemed to have committed a crime behind the wire. In addition to the general physical abuse meted out to the prisoners the camp commandant introduced other measures of cruelty upon these hapless individuals. Prisoners were deprived of warm food for up to four days, they were subjected to long periods of solitary confinement on a diet of bread and water. To supplement these harsh methods Ike introduced corporal punishment into the daily routine. A prisoner would receive 25 strokes with the lash, carried out in the open square on specific orders of the commandant in the presence of assembled SS guards. In order to ensure every SS officer, non-commissioned officer, and SS guard was infused with the same brutal mentality as their commandant, he regularly ensured that each man routinely punished prisoners with the lash without showing the slightest hesitancy, emotion or, most of all, remorse. Only in this way could I guarantee that his concentration camp staff would become hardened to the brutal code that he himself had harshly implemented. He also infused his staff with hatred against Jews, emigrants, homosexuals, and Jehovah Witnesses. Frequently the SS men listened whilst the commandant brazenly delivered lectures about what he considered were the most dangerous enemies of National Socialism. Predominantly, 
he instructed his men to be brutal to the Jews and use whatever violence necessary to keep them in check. However, often the Jews were only seen at roll calls. For long periods, sometimes up to four months, they were shut away in sealed barracks only ever being allowed to leave their beds at mealtimes and roll call. Although some of the staff disliked the brutality of the camp, most were nonetheless inspired by its harsh order and discipline. They were able to bury their emotions and become absorbed by loyalty to the SS. Some would hope that in the future they might run their own concentration camp. In spite of the crude and brutal values of the SS, it offered many of these men a clear example to follow. They saw Dachau as a stepping stone to success within the realms of the SS order. Regular beatings and cruel acts of brutality continued to escalate at Dachau. Most SS men became pitiless and callously thoughtless to human suffering, and their thirst for moving through the ranks far outweighed any moral feelings. They became increasingly convinced that the camp was the most effective instrument available for destroying all elements hostile to the banner of National Socialism. Most of the SS were motivated by Ike's success and his firm grip on his own position within the camp. They watched how the Commandant strengthened his power in order to make the camp run more efficiently. They saw the camp evolve and watched Ike organize Dachau into a model detention center with its various administration departments. There was a medical department, an administration pay office to purchase all supplies, another office to retain all the personal property surrendered by the inmates upon entering the camp, a department for repair and maintenance, and one for the making of the prisoners' uniforms. Ike's staff also observed how he had organized the inmates to work and expand the camp's economic enterprises. They saw how the commandant put to work the prisoners to construct buildings, and to expand the camp to include a locksmith's shop, a saddlery, and a shoemaking and table shop. Ike was a great believer that the inmates were able to endure prison with more discipline if they were allowed to work. For him working in slavery was a mystical declaration that self-sacrifice through endless labor would bring about a kind of spiritual freedom. It was this belief that prompted Ike to display the inscription work brings freedom on the main entrance gate of Dachau. The slogan itself was not new to the National Socialists. For some of Ike's staff their post to Dachau was to mold their future in the ranks of the SS. Not only would it offer them officer status and a regular wage for them and their families, but also it gave them a secure belonging. Ike weeded out those men he regarded not fit for concentration camp duty and only kept reliable, disciplined SS officers, NCOs, and enlisted men. As he expanded the camp system the Commandant's SS Cotter served him with devoted allegiance and fanaticism. Promotions within the SS Cotter were a common occurrence, especially among model SS. His men knew that to progress further through the ranks they would have to strengthen their beliefs that all the prisoners detained inside the concentration camp system were inferior, and that they were implacable enemies of the state, against whom the SS were waging a war. They were aware that the slightest vestige of sympathy towards those in the concentration camps was regarded by the SS as intolerable. They had learned to conceal any type of lingering feeling or compassion for those incarcerated and followed Ike's doctrine of being hard. As inspector of concentration camps he soon established a permanent concentration camp system. The brutal methods of mistreating prisoners were applied in other camps, along with Dachau's harsh disciplinary and punishment regulations, which included the death penalty and punishment by the whip. As with Dachau, solitary confinement, general physical abuse and forced labor became standard practice. By the late 1930s Nazi foreign policy became increasingly aggressive. Ike made it clear to his men that the threat of war meant that the SS would expand to provide greater internal security, and that as a consequence the concentration camps would fill with new prisoners. With new government policies and with prospects of war against Poland looming, 
a more hostile attitude was instilled across the concentration camp system. There was even less tolerance towards the inmates and new slogans of hatred and discrimination were plastered around the camps for guards to read. The most cruel and inhuman concentration camps were also considered Sach Senyazin, Buchenwald, and Ravensbrück, which were also called death factories. Their prisoners were women, men, and children, representing a political threat to the dictatorial regime. The purpose of such camps was to exterminate people just because they had a different ideology. Eternal memory to the prisoners, martyrs, and victims of Nazi concentration camps and World War II. Thank you for watching. See you soon in next video.